And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And, uh, you know, we've entitled the message today, Living Who You Are. Living Who You Are. And, you know, that could be a credo today, right? You live whoever you are. Just, just live however God's made you. You live that way. Right? Maybe you've heard this. I woman at the base said this to me a few months ago, and I was like, what? And she said, no, you do you, boo. Right? You just, you do, you do you. Whatever you are, whatever you need to live, however you need to do that, you do that. And, and that's how the world kind of looks at it today. You know, you live out who you are, and, and that just means whoever you think you are at the moment, then you go live that out, and you go live that out freely without care, without anybody else, without worry. And, and we've seen where that runs in our world, right? It runs into a brick wall, and everything looks like it's broken because that's exactly what happens. And so um, today, though, Paul wants to talk about that, and we'll put it in context. Because the reality of all that Paul has done in 1 Timothy, like we said, is, is how to build the church. How do you build the church God's way? How, what's the church supposed to look like, right? The church isn't our idea. The church is God's idea. And so we've got to figure out how God wants it to run. We're told to reflect Christ and what the church is to do. And, and yet... Um, not, and yet, so that's what, that's what he tells us to do. And yet in this passage, he does focus on Timothy. And he takes a moment in six verses to talk about Timothy and about how you, how you live out Christ, even and maybe especially in the face of great responsibility that's laid on you in Christ. And I got to tell you, we all have a great responsibility. Right? We've been talking about that. If you, if you are... Um, at our annual meeting last week, you, you heard my heart and my challenge to you guys of that really we want 2020 to be a year where we set our people free because the, the command in Christ is, is that if you are a part of, of this local body, if this is your home, God says then, all right, I've given you gifts and you, you need to use them for the building up of the body of Christ. And how are we doing that? And, and we really want to set people free and we really want to give platforms for that in some senses, but we really also want you to be seeking out God and saying, well, who am I and where do I belong in this great story? Because there are no spectators in the church of Jesus Christ. There are, no, there are to be no spectators in the church of Jesus Christ. And like I said last Sunday at the annual meeting, that includes, hey, listen, Bible study is good. Please come out to Bible study, but please don't think that you're using your gifts by attending Bible study. All right, Bible study is good, but it's to equip you in the using of your gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. And there shouldn't be any spectator in the church of Jesus Christ sitting on the sidelines. Right? And I, I gave you, the, even, even to the point of, I gave you the, the example of Corey Ten Boom, who the last three years of her life was restricted to her bed. And if you know anything about the story of Corey Ten Boom, that about killed her probably. And yet, she said, all right, God, that means my season right now is to pray. And so she was a warrior for the church of Jesus Christ in prayer. There are no spectators in Jesus Christ. Where God has you is where you are, and that's where you need to be. And yet, you need to move on in that. And so, and so we, we've talked about that, right? But he focuses in a little bit more about, about building, like I said, not just building this church. Um but to Timothy, and how do you stand in the face of this great responsibility? And I would tell you, for all of us, this great responsibility, this burden of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he's given to us, the great responsibility and yet the great privilege to share Jesus with the world, to exalt Christ in our lives and to point others to him in every way and in everything that we do so that Jesus Christ is lifted up and that people would see him and come to him and know him. Because we live in a world where hope is fading. You know, we talked about hope, and that's our... We, we live in a world that, that is grasping for stuff, and, and, and too often they're left with nothing in their hands. And then where do you go? Well, guess what? We have the hope. We have the answer to that, to how to live. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And so here we are, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, starting in verse 11, what I want you to see here is simply the title that he uses to talk to Timothy at this moment. 
So on, on almost all of the translations except the New American Standard, which is what we have here, and if you don't, if you don't have a Bible, you can take one in, in, in one of the seats in front of you or underneath you, but um, it starts out with, O man of God. O man of God. So Paul refers to Timothy as a man of God. Now, that might not sound very much like, okay, who cares, right? I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, everybody wants to be a man or a woman of God, right? I mean, can we, can we, if you're in Christ, I sure hope you want to be known as a man or a woman of God. But do you realize that there is not one other person in the New Testament who is referred to as a man of God except Timothy? It's interesting because it's a pretty common terminology in the Old Testament where they were called men of God. Uh, and although almost exclusively used of prophets and people who spoke for, G for God. You know, people who had given their life for the transmission of God's word, of the preaching and, the, and, and really the revelation uh, giving of God's word to prophets of, of, of people who were before God. And so it was commonly used, like I said, uh, in the Old Testament. One commentator says this, uh, O man of God, it's a huge phrase, says Paul designates Timothy as a man of God, a title given to Moses, David, Elijah, and Elisha in the Old Testament. Like I said, common in the Old Testament, but only one other person, uh, no other person but Timothy in the New Testament. Um, can you, what amazing thing to be called. And, and understand this, that's all they had back then. All they had was the Old Testament. So Timothy would understand this reference of this, of this title that he's putting on him as a man of God, as a person before him. Ray Steadman says this, he says, um, the title combines two remarkable concepts, man in his weakness, confusion, blindness, and failure, and God in his majesty, in his greatness and power. To be a man of God is the greatest title that could be bestowed upon Timothy. Everyone who has the Spirit of God indwelling in him has the desire to claim that title for himself, to be a man or a woman of God, not a man of the world, not a man of flesh, but a man of God. That's who he refers to him as, as, as you, you're, Timothy, you're a man of God. A man of God, by the way, who has great responsibility on his, on his shoulders. He's been tasked by Paul to make sure that the church of Jesus Christ in Ephesus at this point would stay on track, that the things that would come in that would take them off track, that he would, he would kind of skirt them off and make sure he deals with that, that in, in, the, in the running of the church and how the leadership of the church was set up and the things of the church would be done to make sure that it's done God's way because the church is in need of reflecting God, not man. See, we're way too guilty of trying to produce a corporate structured churches in America today and, and in some senses, right, there needs, to be, there needs to be running of churches, and as you get bigger, you know, there needs to be supervision and those kind of things. But we don't need to look for the corporate thing. We need to reflect Jesus. What does Jesus want the church to look like? How does Jesus want the church to run? And so that's what we've talked about, and, and, and that's what he, he's going for here. And yet the same is true for the man of God, is that the man of God is not to look like the world. We're not to look like everybody else does and I'm not talking about on the outside I'm not talking about in dress but I'm talking about on the inside and how we act and the things that we think and the things that are priorities and the way that we order our lives should not be like everybody else which by the way mostly is pragmatic to them at the moment if it works for now then it's okay even though it might not work for any period beyond the now which is why we continue to rocket, run into brick walls with things broken in our world today. Because people are making momentary decisions and momentary life choices that have great effects to the rest of lives and to other lives around us. So Paul speaks directly to Timothy and challenges him as a man of God. And again, that title, I think, would have made Timothy take a start and then say, what does this mean now? And so, I think if we could break it down, what we're going to break it down today is, what is the posture of the man of God, of the woman of God to be in this world? If we would want to be one who called a, a man or a woman of God, what would our posture in this world be toward the things and how we live? 
And he gives three areas specifically to Timothy in this passage of what our posture should be. And that's what we're going to go for. The first one is to flee. You look in verse 11. It's very short. What he says, he says, flee from these things, O man of God, you man of God. Flee from these things. We're told that the posture of the righteous is to be at times running away, to be fleeing situations, to be fleeing things from within us and outside of us. And, and I got to tell you, the problem too often in the church of Jesus Christ is we flee, but we flee the wrong things. We flee, you know, uh, instead of fleeing temptation or fleeing from sin, we, we flee from witnessing. We flee from standing up for what is right. We flee from taking a stand for Jesus Christ and living for him in the midst of a generation that won't live for him. Right? We, we flee things, but way too often the very things that we're not supposed to flee and the things that we should be fleeing, we don't flee. That's our problem. For him, specifically, he's talking about what we just talked about, which was last week, that he's to flee. And, uh, you know, it's funny, as you study it and then you look back at it, I should have had these points last week, I didn't. But really three things that he needs to flee here. Right? He needs to flee conceit, contentiousness, and coveting. It's a perfect sermon. Three C's. Conceit, contentiousness, and coveting. Look at what he says in, back up in verse 4. He says, or verse 3, If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of the Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness. In other words, I'm just going to live. All right, God says this, but that doesn't work for the now, so I'm going to go do it the way I think it needs to be done. So what do you do? You stand in place of God. That's what he says in verse 4. He is conceited and understands nothing. How dare we think we know better than God? And yet we do. Listen, we would never say that out loud, not in the evangelical church, right? Not, not at Grace Gospel. We would never say, I know better than God. Until we run up against something about what we know God would want to do, and we go, well, you know what, that doesn't work right now. That doesn't work for me right now. It's not really what I want to do. I don't really want to live that way. I don't really want to do that thing. Um, and, and this is how we put it in the evangelical world. Well, the Holy Spirit isn't convicting me about that. And I'm like, that's because you're not opening your ears. I've had people who've said stuff about directly in Scripture who've said, well, if it was that important, wouldn't the Holy Spirit convict me about it? I'm like, if, if God's given it to you in his word, he needs to speak something special for you. And yet that's how we act toward God. Because we're like, no, 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 this really works better. We've been talking about this over the last few weeks, right? We take God's word so often, and we're going, well, you know what? That's really good, but if we just tweak it a little bit and make it sound a little bit more, then that'll fit into the world a little bit better. People will accept that a little bit more. And do we wonder why we have churches in America who are running off the end of cliffs. And, and you know what? People aren't flocking to those churches. They're running away from them. And they sh thank God. Um, because we're afraid to speak the truth. Because we get real pragmatic about that. All right, so we're not to be conceited. We're not to stand in that. Not contentious. He says, verse 4, He is conceited and understands nothing, but has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, constant friction between men of depraved mind uh, and, and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means to great gain, right? So it's interesting how the contentiousness, this fighting that happens, even within the church, as we seek to do what we want to do, and, and, and certainly, we, if we understand contentiousness, it's in our culture right now, right? Where if somebody stands up against an idea that you have, oh my goodness, there's not a disagreement where we can talk out anything. There is just a, a lobbying of, of everything that we, that we have. You know, we see it in our political realm every day, unfortunately, and it's destroying our country in my mind. Um, we see it, but we see it too often in the church, too, where we, where we focus on these things these exterior things that are out there, not related to the gospel. And, and instead of healthily disagreeing and healthily building each other up and iron sharpening iron with the word of God, instead we, we fight and we lob and we separate. And that's what Satan wants. 
That's Satan's strategy. Satan's strategy is always to separate, never to bring together. And then uh, not only... Um, not only conceit and contentiousness, but coveting. And, you know, he says, uh, verse 6, but godliness actually means to, is, is a means to great gain when accompanied with contentment. Last week we talked about it in the terms of contentment is what we have. We have brought nothing into the world and can take nothing out of it. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and, by, and, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This is talking to the church. I mean, and I got to tell you, it, this, this is talking to the church of America. Certainly the church on Long Island. Where, where possessions and, and what we have and, and, and looking a certain way or wanting more, not willing to sacrifice for the Lord, uh, not if it's going to mean something of sacrifice for me, of what I can't have or what I need, in quotes, right, what I need. And like he said, you know, longing for it. So that means you can be filthy rich, and, and be in a bad place, and you can be dirt poor and be in a bad place, because if all you want is more, you're never going to be satisfied. Because <laughs> there's always more to have. There's always going to be somebody who has more than you have. There's always going to be someone who drives a better car, who looks better than you do, who has more than you have. Always. If you're not content with what you have. So look at what he says. So those three areas, he specifically talks to flee from those. You can't allow those to suck you in is what he says to you. It's him. But he doesn't say just watch out for them. He says, man of God, woman of God, run from them. Run from them. There is no shame in running away from the things which will ensnare you. There is no shame of running away from that, like cutting it off, taking it away, getting rid of it. I don't do that. Even though people might teach you, well, oh, come on. You, don't, you, you won't go to that movie because of that little thing, or you won't, you won't get the internet because what you're tempted? Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, you won't, you won't go to that place. You won't do that thing. You won't hang out with these people. And listen, we need to be the light in darkness, and we need to be able to do that, but if it's going to suck us in, we better run from it, <laughs> and we better run fast, and we better run far. How many do we know in the church of Jesus Christ today who have fallen into the temptations that are around us and the harm that it does the church of Jesus Christ? The harm. It's because we won't run. It's because we won't run. And then we're like, well, you know, uh, it's almost cowardly to do that. I don't know. There was a man of God once um, who lived and, and uh, you know, a little contentiousness in his family. As a matter of fact, his brothers, the, the 10 of them, 10 of his 11 brothers, sold him into slavery. They were going to kill him, but they were gracious toward him. And they, instead, they sold him into slavery. Isn't that a nice thing? You guys are great, right? And so Joseph gets sent off to Egypt, and God is with him. And, and he's just going to serve, and he's going to do well. And he does well, and he rises to the top, right? Because he's just serving, serving, serving. And yet his master's wife says, ooh, he looks really nice. And so he, she wants him for herself. And he won't do it. And he won't do it until finally what happens, right? She corners him basically and he runs out of there. Runs out of there. What a cowardly act, right? Nope. That's a hero. I, 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 you know, that, that's a man of God who understands the temptations that are before him that he cannot walk into because not only is he going to sin against this master, but he says in that passage, I will sin against God. I cannot sin against God. I won't do it. So I'll run away from it. I'll get out of there. Uh, in, in, in the church of Jesus Christ, there are men and women of God who at times need to run. We need to flee. We, we, need to, we need to not entertain certain things because for us, they are snares. And they will capture us. 
right? But he says, all right, it, it's not just running away. You just can't run away and that's it, but you got to run after also. So look at what he says. Verse 11, flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. So again, it's not just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not sin, right? That's religion. Religion is stop sinning, just stop sinning. You know, just, you can do it, just stop sinning, and you'll be all right, and then you'll be right with God. And the reality is that we understand that in Jesus Christ, as Patty so beautifully said, for all those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and the Savior, your hope is secure. But by the way, you become part of who he is, and your future is set. And so I understand that I'm a different person. I'm a man or a woman of God. And so I need to pursue the things of God, not the things of the world. As a matter of fact, the, the six things that he lists here, some would break down as the first three are toward God, the, the, referring to God or in reference to God, and the last three are in reference to man. So he starts out with righteousness or godly, and godliness. Righteousness and godliness. And it's interesting because... You know, oftentimes you look, and a lot of, co some commentators, not a lot, some commentators will say, this is toward righteous behavior. Again, so we, we got to kind of get it right, right? And too often the problem with that is, is religion. When you read Paul, though, when he uses righteousness and godliness, it's often as a state of being of who you are. It's, it's, a, it's understanding, uh, you know, he's usually speaking them in terms of understanding who you are. So it's, it's pursuing the things, not as outward behaviors, but as inward realities. Of inward realities of who I am in Jesus Christ. And so, righteous behavior flows out of me, not because I've got to be righteous so that I can be righteous, right? I've got to act righteous, I should say, so I can be righteous. Instead, I act righteous because I am righteous. See, the let me tell you something. That is a huge difference. This is religion. Religion says you act righteous so that you can be righteous. Relationship with Jesus Christ says that you act righteous because you are righteous. Because your nature now in Jesus Christ is one of, of perfection. You are fully sanctified. Well, I'm still working it out. And you are. And I get it. It's a fight. That's why we got to pursue it. We've got to constantly pursue this thing of, of this understanding that I am right in Jesus and I'm, I, I, I have godliness within me because God lives within me. And it's not that I have to do something so that I can earn, although we don't talk about it in those terms, but so that I can earn the right to be called a child of God. Listen, children of God, you need to act right. But not just so the outside is clean. That's pharisaical. What do you scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites? Because you're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you're painted beautifully, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Christ is concerned with the outside. Make no mistake about that. But only as it flows from the inside. And that's our reality. And that's how Paul usually talks about righteousness and godliness. And so i got to believe, and I've read several commentators that have said that's exactly what he's talking about. Again, pursue these things not as outward behaviors, but inward realities. Righteousness and godliness. He says faith. You know, trusting in the one who calls you. It's interesting, and it's an interesting comment that, that we pursue faith. Right? And those of us who have been in Jesus Christ and for any period of time understand that we have to pursue and, and remind ourselves of the fact that God is still on the throne. There, it, it is every single one of us who's had somebody else, if, if we've had good people surrounding us, who have reminded us, hey, God's in charge. Right? God's still on the throne. God hasn't left anything. But wait a second. My world is falling apart. My world is coming apart. Things are coming apart in me. How, you know, where is God in all of this? And we need people around us who will sit with us and who will mourn with us, but then who say to us, listen, it doesn't mean that God went any place. It doesn't mean that God stopped loving you. It doesn't mean that, that you've fallen out of Jesus somehow. See, again, that's pharisaical. Oh, something bad happened to you? Oh, maybe you're not a Christian. 
oh, you did something even bad. Again, we're not supposed to sin. We're supposed to be holy because he is holy and he is in us. And so our nature should reflect holiness. Right? And so the world says then, oh, but wait a second. Then if you don't always act holy, maybe you're not in Christ. See, that's Satan. Satan always wants to separate and always wants you to think that, that maybe Jesus doesn't love you anymore because you haven't earned his love today. He can't earn his love. That's the whole point of Christmas. Listen, Christmas is the, and Easter, if it's about anything else, it's about the fact that a God came into our world, and like I said last night, invaded our world, condescended to us, because we could never rise up to him. And so he invaded our world, not to be born, not to be praised, not to live and be able to, hey man, now I know what it's like to hang out with you, but so that he could be tempted in a way, every way, and yet without sin, so that he could die on a cross and take upon himself our sins and be our propitiatory, substitutionary atonement in Christ. A propitiation in Christ, in, in, in God. Where he takes God's wrath for us in him. And, and we understand this, right? It's not just, faith is not just a momentary decision where we decide for Jesus Christ, where we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and there's a yes there. It is an everyday walk where we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. It's an everyday walk. And no matter how you think about how you come to him in the beginning, we all understand that we struggle in that walk of faith. We need to pursue that. That constant reminder. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Walk in faith. 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 Walk in, but it doesn't work. It doesn't look good. It's not pragmatic. It doesn't feel good. Walk in faith. Because God is sure. And steady. The last three, he would say toward outwardly. Love, perseverance, and, and gentleness. Uh, love, outward posture toward others and how we act, right? Love. I mean, there's a lot to be said on love. Read 1 Corinthians 13. It's all about how we, how we exercise our gifts in love. Read, read all throughout Scripture about how we're to love one another. Love God, love one another. Love God, love one another. Love God, love one another. I mean, it's just constant, right? Because we constantly need reminders. Love God, love one another. I love what it says, uh, uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Just in the beginning of that verse, he says, Oh, nothing to anyone except, oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. Oh, nothing to anybody except loving one another. And you know what? That'll never end. There's always a debt of love toward others because Christ has loved me. And so I can never out-love God to keep loving no matter what. <laughs> Perseverance. Oh, don't you love that? Perseverance. Um, you know, not giving up easily, but pressing on. Not, not giving, you know, so many people, so many people in the church of Jesus Christ today who give up on God, who give up on faith, who give up on the things of God. Why? Because it's not going the way they think it should go. Well, again, that's conceitedness. You're not a man of God if you begin to question, you know, it's not the way I think it should go. Well, it, now it might not be the way it should go, but it might be because of your sin. So judge your heart and make sure that you're right to Jesus Christ, that you're lined up to him. And if you are, then you walk steady and firm. And you walk with perseverance and you walk with long suffering. Because Christ is still there. And then he says gentleness. And I love this. I mean, I, I, I don't remember at what context I told you this. I was studying the book of Philippians with the, the, the people out and uh, with, with the air guardsmen. Great study. Please keep praying for that. We've got like 10 people coming. It's just a great study. And uh, we were doing Philippians. And, and we talked about in Philippians chapter 4, right before he talks about praying for everything, you know, not being anxious for anything, but praying you know, and then the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. Right before that, he says, let gentleness, you know, let, let gentleness be who you are. No, let me read it exactly. He said, let your gentle spirit be known to all, for the Lord is near. And as I read that and as I looked at it, I really think what he's talking about there is that 
that there needs to, because he says rejoice in the Lord always. How am I going to rejoice in the Lord always when things aren't going right? Right? Well, the outward expression of me really fully trusting God is gentleness. Because what happens? When things don't go right, we get panicked. We get angry. We get, you know, all, freaked out and all those kind of things. We don't respond in gentleness. Unless we're fully trusted on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then we're not affected, in a sense, by the outward. Why? Because we are anxious for nothing. And in everything by prayer and supplication. Making our requests be made known to God. Trusting our things to Him. And that's why the peace of God which surpasses understanding becomes ours. Again, notice what he says. You have to pursue these things. As a matter of fact, that word pursue in the Greek means to keep on pursuing. It's a lifelong pursuit of these things, Timothy. If you're going to be the man of God that, that I know that you are, he calls him a man of God, you need to flee from those things and you need to pursue Christ. But then there's one more thing in this passage which really talk, takes up the rest of these five verses. He says, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you have called. And you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives all, gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality, and dwells in the in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, or see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Fight the good fight. <laughs> fight the good fight. Again, you know, we're fighting a lot of things in this world, and a lot of them are the wrong things we need to fight. We're fighting for things we shouldn't always be fighting for. Oftentimes we're fighting for respect or we're fighting for esteem or we're fighting for how people look at us or talk to us or deal with us, right? None of us want to feel like we're being put down or put aside or anything like that. And so we fight for that kind of stuff. What many, many arguments within families are about, I don't like the way you talk to me. You know, you said it this way, and you said it that way, or, or you're taking advantage of me, or you're not thinking, right? So it's all about us, and we're protecting our own estate. And so we fight for what we think we want or what we think we should have. Well, listen, he says you've got to fight the good fight. You've got to fight the good fight. Not the things of the world, not the things for myself, but the, for the things of God. The true nature, listen, the true nature of the Christian life is a battleground. It's a battleground. And it's not a battleground to feel better, which is what we think. You know, we talked about this in the past, too. 95, and this is Patrick's statistics. It's no place out there except for me, okay? I'm just going to tell you that truth in advertising, all right? But I firmly believe, I think if we, could, if we could measure all of our prayers, that 95 to 98% of all prayers of all Christians would be about them or something that's important to them. You know, please let me get the job. Please let me feel well. Please let my dad feel well. Please, you know, it's about us. Take away the pain. Take away the heartache. Take away the struggle. And again, that's my statistic, and so that means it might be wrong. I just don't think I am. <laughs> if you're going to preach it, you've got to be confident. But you can't prove it, so. <laughs> um, but, I, but I do. I just, think that, I, I just think a lot of times it's focused on us. I challenged you several months ago. How about we, you know, listen, I'm not saying that you don't pray for God to, to take away something. You know, a disease or, a, you know, to heal somebody. But, but, maybe, but maybe with that. I mean, and truly, I don't mean as a, like an ending just like to tag it on. But maybe we'd say, but you know what, God? If you want to use this for your glory... If you're going to bring people to yourself because of it, if you're going to use it to expand the kingdom, then it's okay. I'll do whatever you need me to do because I'm just your instrument. And, and listen, I don't like it either. I don't like that my pain might be used for God for his kingdom. I'd like him to do it differently, thank you very much. 
but it's not about my pain. It's not about me. It's not even about my comfort. It's about his kingdom. We're in a fight, brothers and sisters, and we know that. We say it. We just don't live like it. You know, listen, many people hope the battle will end on this earth. We're just searching. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Right? Like Longfellow. Peace on earth. I just, where is it going to be? Where is it going to be? Well, ultimately, guess what? Our hope is not in that the world, that the war would stop. And I'm not just talking about the war out there, but even the war in here. Because it won't stop. Praise the Lord. Let's go home. It's just not going to stop. Jesus said, on this earth, you will have trouble. But then what did he say? But take heart. Because I've overcome the world. Listen, your hope is not based on the pain stopping necessarily. Your hope is in the fact that you have a secure future, a hope that will not fade, that will not turn away, that will not tarnish in any way. We have a hope that will never leave. And we've got to start being purveyors of that hope. We've got to start being a people of God that, that deliver that hope to people. Too often what we do is we say, well, I'll pray for you. And we say, well, I'm going to give them hope because I'm going to pray for them. Listen, you're really good, and I think it's great to pray for people. Okay? I think it's great to pray for people. But, but their hope is not that you're going to talk to God. That's not their hope. Their hope is not like, oh, well, well you're going to pray to God for me? Oh, phew. Well, now I'm okay. Nope, that's not their hope. Listen, they're grasping for anything. They'll take any, you, you see somebody truly desperate, even agnostics and atheists, and they're like, well, listen, I don't believe in that, but I'll take anything I can get at this point. It's not their hope, it's their wish. Because it's all about them getting better. Listen, we need to deliver and be the purveyors of, of hope, true hope, that lies in Jesus, that says to them, you know what, you may not survive this illness but you can live in eternity with a Savior who loves you, who came for you, who invaded our world to die that you might have life. And to be honest, you got to give up on yourself. And whether God chooses to, to heal you or not is up to Him. But the reality of it is, I was going to say He may not. The, the reality of it is, statistically, most of the time He doesn't. Does God heal today? I absolutely firmly believe that. Does God heal everybody today who trusts in him? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, everybody dies. Everybody dies. Maybe not at the exact time you want them to, and maybe not in a way that they should ever because there's sin that happens, right? I mean, the, the sin that, that, that's put out against people, it shouldn't have been like that. But everybody dies. He says, and I love what he says, he says, fight the good fight. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Take hold of it. Start living for eternity. Stop living for the moment. Take hold of it. It's already ours. When we trust in Jesus, we transfer, right, from that kingdom of darkness into kingdom of light. Colossians 1, 13 says, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. If you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you know him today, you have been transferred. Your, your reality is, is that you are in a different kingdom. I know you're still living here, but you live in a different kingdom for a different time. And therefore, we need to start fighting, and we need to start living this life in a way where we're taking hold of it, and we're giving it out, and we're living for Christ, and we're taking that good fight, and we're preaching to G Jesus and the hope that comes in him alone. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So then, church, why are we so ashamed of the gospel? Well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Then why don't we preach the gospel more? Well, I, I, I told him that I love God, I'm telling you, listen, I think that's good, and that might be a, like a way-beginning start, but that is not the gospel. The fact that, well, I praised God in front of him is not the gospel. W watch an award show that people sing about all kinds of evil and everything, and then watch them praise Jesus for it. 
getting an award. The gospel is the gospel. That we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but in Christ he made us alive. Alive. I like what Ray Steadman says. He says, and he talks about the parallel passage really to this is Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 6, 11, it says this. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So he says this about that. To put on the whole armor of God and to take hold of the eternal life are one and the same thing. That armor is Jesus Christ. His strength, his wisdom, his love, his gentleness, his peace appropriated in your life. He is in charge of what's happening to you. And you rest on that fact. That is the way you fight the good fight of faith. That is the way you take hold of eternal life. You take hold by, by trusting in Jesus Christ for everything. I mean everything. Because it's his power that we're going to do it. It's his power that we're going to win. It's not because you're that smart. It's not because you're that good. It's not because you work that hard. Matter of fact, the only reason why you can work this hard is because God's given you the strength to be able to work that hard. See, nothing comes back to us. It's all to him. As a matter of fact, he wants to remind us, I guess, and just because that's how Paul is, he just wants to say, oh, and by the way, who are we doing this for? See, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach, that you don't, you, don't, you don't mess, you don't tweak anything of God till the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring out about at the proper time. He's going to come when he's going to come. He who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in the unapproachable light with whom no man is seen or can see. To him be the honor, and I love it, and eternal dominion. You know what that means? It's all All he's telling to us is don't, don't give up, don't back down. You stay focused on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Why? So that you will not falter, so that you'll not lose hope, so that you'll not grow weary. Listen, we fight because the kingdom is worth it. And we fight truly only under his banner. And if you're fighting and under any other banner, if you've redrawn the picture at all, you're fought, fighting under the raw ban wrong banner. And like we said last week, you know, stop chasing after the things which are going to go away. Start chasing after the things which will last for eternity. And what is that? That is the hearts and the minds of people. It's lives that will last. He's the king. He is the king. He is the one that we honor. He is the one that we exalt. And by the way, he's the one that we point others to. Wow. So let's do it with every ounce of everything that we have. It's a good fight. But it's a fight. Father God, I love you. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for, for invading our world and saving us through Christ Jesus. I, I thank you, Father, that your spirit has come to us, Lord. I thank you, Father, that we have life in no other name but in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. We don't, we don't stand before you because of anything of ourselves. We only stand before you because of you, because of what you've done, because of the fact that you've come to us, Father. So may we live it. May we stop trying to figure out our own brand of Christianity, our own version of how it's to be lived, and let us just live it how you've called us to live it. Lord, let us flee from the things that will ensnare us. Let us pursue the things that will bring us closer to you and that will, will help us to live it out in Christ. And Lord, let us fight the good fight. Let us fight because you are worth it. Because you are the king. You are God. Lord, let us do that not in our own power, not in our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
that lives and resides within us in Christ. I love you. I thank you in Jesus' name.